Hello everyone and welcome to ADO's April webinar. This month we'll be taking a closer look at IBS, which is estimated to affect between 9 and 23% of the world's population. Many of these people are unaware they have a medically recognized condition. So if you're suffering symptoms that have you feeling unexplainably irritable, this is the webinar for you. Joining us today is clinical assistant professor from Georgetown University and ADO's medical director, Dr. Howard Zahowski. Welcome, Dr. Zahowski, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Tom. All right, so today we're going to be talking about IBS, which stands for Irritable Bowel Syndrome. For a long time, this was a catch-all term for people who had unexplained stomach pain, and the doctors didn't know why, so we just told them, well, there's nothing seriously wrong you just have IBS. Usually people who were diagnosed with IBS were young women who had had CAT scans and maybe even colonoscopies that didn't show anything. And we didn't really have a lot of ways to go beyond that to diagnose them. So we just told them they had IBS and for the most part had to live with it. Nowadays that isn't nearly the way that we do things anymore. We have a lot more diagnostic tests. We have a lot more conditions that we can identify, that we can hopefully treat. And if you still are felt to have IBS, we have a lot more treatments to solve your problems. Now, before I go further in talking about how we're going to diagnose and treat IBS, we have to understand exactly what IBS is. Here is a picture of your guts. Now, kind of cut off at the top, you can kind of see a pink, things sticking out from the top of the picture, that's your stomach. Then throughout the middle, these wiggly worms are your small intestine. At the bottom left of the picture, right near where the appendix is, you can see where the worms, the pink worms kind of merge into the green fatter area, which is your large intestine or colon. That area where they combine is called the cecum. And then the green large intestine carries the food, the digested food that you've eaten, which is now stool, through from the bottom right side, from the bottom left side of the picture, which is the right side of your body, up to right underneath your ribs on the right, across your middle, down your left side, and out your rectum. IBS, or irritable bowel syndrome, is mainly a condition of the small intestine. That's where most of the digestion of your food takes place. Your stomach actually doesn't do any digestion. It just kind of grinds up the food. You may have heard that you have stomach acid. Doesn't that help to digest the food? No, actually, the main purpose of stomach acid is just to kill any infections in your food. That's why every time you eat one little bacteria worth of salmonella, you don't get sick because your stomach is actually killing off any dirt or germs in the food that you're eating. Then once you get to the small intestine, now you get to the point where real digestion is taking place. So what's going on in irritable bowel? Well, let's talk about how your bowel functions. Everything has to move in one direction in your bowel. And in order to keep everything moving through the small and large bowel and even in your stomach in the right direction, you have a condition called peristalsis. Peristalsis, you can see on the slide, is a series of involuntary wave-like muscle contractions that move the food along the digestive tract. I always like analogies, so I'm going to give you some analogies. Imagine you are a car stopped along a road at a stoplight. Once that light turns green, everything has to move in a coordinated fashion for all the cars to get going. The cars closest to the light have to move first, and the cars further back have to wait for that to happen until they can move. The same thing is happening in your gut. The further along parts of your gut have to open up, so when your gut squeezes down, everything moves forward. Now I'm gonna use another analogy. Let's talk about a tube of toothpaste. When you open that tube of toothpaste, in order to squeeze out the toothpaste, you have to open up the lid so that the toothpaste can come out. If you just try and squeeze the toothpaste, Without opening up the lid, nothing's going to happen. You can hurt, you can get cramps in your hand from squeezing really hard, but unless that toothpaste is open, nothing's going to move forward. On the other hand, once you do open it, where do you want to squeeze? You want to squeeze from the bottom of the tube to the top. 
Why? Because if you squeeze from the middle of the tube, some of the toothpaste is going to go forward and some of the toothpaste is going to go backwards. Peristalsis acts like that as well. When you have a peristalsis in your intestines, the upstream portion of the intestine where the food already came from needs to stay tightly squeezed so that it doesn't move in the wrong direction. You need everything to be moving downwards. Well, in peristalsis, you get the upstream part holding tight, the middle part giving a good hard squeeze, and the downstream part opening up so everything moves in a nice orderly direction. Now, in, in irritable bowel syndrome, there's multiple things that can go wrong. One is that the peristalsis can me mess up. The downstream part, the cap of the toothpaste, if you will, can remain closed. It doesn't open up properly. So you have part of your gut squeezing and part of the part where the food is supposed to be going to remaining closed. It's like the car's in the middle of a traffic jam trying to move quickly forward if the cars at the stoplight aren't moving. What are you going to get? You're going to get a car accident, traffic jam, and it's going to actually make things harder in the long run. And, and you're going to have five miles of backup along that road now because of one accident at the stoplight. There's a couple of other things that can go into irritable bowel syndrome as well. In irritable bowel syndrome, you can also not absorb fluid well out of your gut. The main purpose of the small intestine is not actually to absorb the nutrients in the food. It's to absorb the fluid that you drink. You drink a lot more fluid than you consume food in an average day. And if all of that fluid just came straight through you, you'd have horrible diarrhea. So it is important for your small intestine to absorb all of that fluid. Otherwise, you get a lot more contractions and a lot more discomfort. In addition, in irritable bowel syndrome, you don't absorb all of the nutrients and the food properly. What happens is you end up with excessive food moving downward through your intestines. Now, okay, other than getting a little skinny, which maybe people are thinking that wouldn't be so bad, what is the harm of not absorbing all of your food? Well, that food becomes food now for bacteria that normally live in your intestines. The bacteria will ferment, just like making beer or wine, will ferment the hydrates in your undigested food, and that produces gas. And people with irritable bowel syndrome oftentimes are very, very bloated and gassy because the bacteria is fermenting the undigested and unabsorbed food further down in your intestines. Finally, there's a problem with nerves. The nerves that go to the intestines in patients with irritable bowel syndrome tend to be oversensitive. You know that there's always people with higher pain tolerance and lower pain tolerance. We don't have a medical explanation for that, but some people's nerves that go to their intestines are a little bit more sensitive than other people. So when you or I might just have a cramp in our stomach, they feel it much more intensely. So those are the four elements of irritable bowel. There's the disordered peristalsis. There's the excessive fluid in the intestines. There's the, int the excessive gas from fermentation of unabsorbed nutrients. And there's the oversensitivity of the nerves. And in order to treat irritable bowel in today's medical science, you need to be able to address many of those symptoms at the same time or you're not going to get the irritable bowel syndromes under control. So how are we going to be able to handle, manage, and treat irritable bowel? Well, it starts with food. There are a lot of foods that are particularly good for patients with irritable bowel, and there are some foods that are particularly bad for patients with irritable bowel. The bad foods, if you will, are FODMAP foods. What is a FODMAP? A FODMAP is a specific type of carbohydrate that the bacteria in your intestines really like. There are also carbohydrates that tend to pull extra fluid into the intestines. As we said, patients with irritable bowel syndrome oftentimes have too much fluid in their intestines and that, that prevents them from 
feeling good because their body is having to move all of this fluid along, which can oftentimes result in them getting diarrhea. So some of the foods that have a lot of FODMAPs include, as you can see, apples, apricots, watermelon, certain vegetables, especially asparagus, certain grain products, milk products such as, such as cow's milk, custard, because they contain lactose, which is a FODMAP. And then there's a list of other things as well. You can see lower down foods that are particularly good that are lower in FODMAPs. Certain foods like bananas, which actually absorb fluid, raspberries, vegetables such as carrots and celery and green beans, and gluten-free breads or cereal, they protect you against building up too much fluid in your intestines. These are actually things that absorb water rather than pulling extra water in. There are actually some laxatives that work because they contain FODMAPs. For instance, you may have heard of Miralax. Miralax works by pulling extra fluid into your intestines, which allows there to be more water in your intestines, which for people who are prone to constipation moves things along. But for patients with irritable bowel who already have too much fluid in their intestines, taking a laxative like that will actually cause a lot of intestinal distress. So you're a patient who's having a lot of abdominal pain and you've seen your doctor and they've done a CAT scan and it doesn't show anything and your doctor has just told you, well, you must just have irritable bowel and put you on treatment for irritable bowel. Are there any other questions that you should be asking? Are there any other diagnoses that your doctor should be considering? And the answer is definitely yes. The first disease which often gets mistaken for irritable bowel is inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, as opposed to IBS. Yes, the acronyms get very confusing even for doctors. The two main types of inflammatory bowel diseases are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Now, ulcerative colitis usually does not get mistaken for irritable bowel very often because it tends to produce bloody diarrhea, which is a problem in and of itself. But Crohn's disease can oftentimes be mistaken for irritable bowel disease. Crohn's is a disease where your body actually attacks your own intestines, which as you can see in the middle part of this picture, causes muscle hypertrophy, fissures, which are little cuts, and cobblestone appearance, focal thickening of certain parts of your intestine. This causes a lot of the same symptoms as irritable bowel. You don't absorb fluid as well. You end up getting swelling of your intestines. You can get obstruction of your bowel. You can get a lot of belly pain. You can get problems with paralysis. And it can be very hard to diagnose because Crohn's disease can affect your entire bowel or it can affect just very small segments of your bowel. Doctors can do colonoscopies in order to look at the inside of your colon and we can do endoscopies to look at your stomach or the very beginning part of your small, in, small intestine. But it's very, very hard to see the inside of your most of your small intestine. Crohn's disease oftentimes will affect just one small area in different spots in your small intestine, making actually being able to see it and take a biopsy of it, which can give you the diagnosis, very difficult. There are certain blood tests that can suggest Crohn's disease. And now we have certain advanced tests, including something called a capsule endoscopy, where you literally swallow a tiny camera, no bigger than a pill, and it will take pictures of your entire intestines and you can sometimes pick up inflammatory bowel disease that otherwise would be missed. Now, we already said that lactose is actually one of those FODMAP carbohydrates that can be very difficult to be tolerated by someone with irritable bowel syndrome. Well, sometimes the entire problem isn't necessarily FODMAPs, but specifically a problem with lactose. I'm sure everybody's heard of people having lactose intolerance. What is lactose intolerance? Well, lactose is actually a sugar that is made up of two parts. One of those two parts is called galactose and one of those parts is called glucose. Your body cannot absorb lactose. Nobody's body can. In order to absorb lactose, you need a certain chemical called lactose dehydrogenase 
to break lactose into two parts, the galactose and the glucose. Some people have more of this enzyme than others, and some people can lose this enzyme as they get older. As a result, they become unable to absorb the lactose. Your body starts to see the lactose like your skin would see poison ivy. The chemical in the poison ivy, the little powder that is released by the poison ivy leaves, is not in and of itself toxic, but your body is, the best way to say, allergic to it. Your body senses it, senses it very, very strongly, and sends a huge immune response to attack it. That's what causes all those blisters on your skin. Not the toxin itself, but your body's immune response to the toxin. The same thing in lactose intolerance. Your body sees this lactose, that the lactose has gotten to a part of the intestine where there's not supposed to be lactose anymore. Um, it's supposed to have all been turned into galactose and glucose by now. And your body has a very strong immune response, which attacks the lactose and causes thickening and irritation of the intestines beyond the place where the lactose was supposed to be broken down and subsequently absorbed. It will look a lot on, let's say, capsule endoscopy like Crohn's disease, where your body is also attacking yourself. The thing is, in Crohn's disease, you're doing it for no good reason. In lactose intolerance, you're doing it because the lactose has been essentially scalding your, the inside of your intestine because of the immune response. Unlike irritable bowel, you don't need to eliminate all of the FODMAPs from your diet. You just need to eliminate the lactose from your diet. Alternatively, there's a lot of lactose-free products on the market right now, such as lactate, in which the lactose has already been chemically broken down before you drink it. There's also lactate pills, which actually give you that chemical, the lactose dehydrogenase, so that you take it with your dairy and it will break down the lactose for you and not cause the problems associated with lactose intolerance. So if you're having IBS symptoms, before you completely eliminate all of these things from your diet, you should start by just trying abstaining from lactose first or trying some lactate pills and see if that resolves many of your symptoms. The next condition that gets mistaken for lactose is a lot, that gets, excuse me, that gets mistaken for irritable bowel syndrome a lot is celiac disease. Now, I don't have a slide for the celiac disease, but this is much like the lactose intolerance, except the offending carbohydrate, which again is also a different kind of FODMAP, is gluten. There's been a lot of talk in the press about gluten insensitivity and celiac disease as of late. And in people with celiac disease, we unfortunately don't have a pill that we can give them to help them break down gluten. But the gluten is basically recognized much like the lactose is in lactose intolerance. Your body sees, your body is unable to break down the, the gluten like it's supposed to. The gluten gets to a part of the intestine where it's not supposed to be, and your body attacks it, leading to a scalding and inflammation of the inside of your intestine. So again, before we just eliminate all of the FODMAPs from your diet because of irritable bowel syndrome, it's a good idea to consider the, whether you have celiac. Now, unlike lactose and kind of similarly to inflammatory bowel disease, there are actually specific blood tests for celiac disease. So before you go swearing off all bread products, you should go see your doctor and ask for the blood test for celiac disease so that we know for sure whether or not that's something you need to do. Because a gluten-free diet, although it is getting much more common, is still something that's difficult to live with in today's day and age unless you want to spend a whole lot of money at Whole Foods. So what do you do if you have irritable bowel? Well, we already talked about avoiding certain foods, the FODMAPs, but there have been a lot of different medicines tried over the years for irritable bowel with very varying success. The oldest kind of most trusted irritable bowel medicine is called dicyclamine, also known as bentol. This is strictly an anti-peristalsis, anti-spasm medicine. It keeps the muscles of your intestines from contracting. Now, that can be helpful if the excessive contractions and the poor peristalsis is the main cause of your irritable bowel syndrome symptoms but it's clearly only going to attack one of those four pillars of 
irritable bowel syndrome. It's not going to take care of the excessive gas. It's not going to take care of the excessive fluid. And because of that, it is not going to relieve all of your symptoms, and it's not going to relieve the oversensitivity of the nerves. So the bentol is only going to be so good at treating irritable bowel syndrome. So what other treatments do we have? Well, there are several new medicines that have just hit the market in the last several years. The first one is called Linzess. Linzess does two things. It attacks two different parts of the irritable bowel pillars. The first is that it accelerates forward movement. It helps to unscrew that cap off of the toothpaste and allows things to move forward more easily. In addition, it also calms the nerves that go to the intestines. So those people who just have some neurologic oversensitivity of their intestines, it can calm that as well. There's two different categories of irritable bowel. One's IBS-C and one's IBS-D. IBS-C, patients have more of the problems with the poor peristalsis, and they tend to end up getting actually constipated. Linzess, because it gets things moving forward better, is more of a IBS-C, treats more IBS that's associated with constipation better. On the other hand, there's another relatively new medicine called Viberzi, V-I-B-E-R-Z-I. This is a medicine that usually treats IBS-D or IBS associated with diarrhea. If you have too much liquid in your intestines, as we talked about, then what can happen is you end up getting many frequent watery bowel movements as well as a lot of cramps that go along with much too much fluid in your intestines. Verberzi, similar to Linzess, calms the nerves that go to your intestines and makes you less sensitive to the cramps that you might get associated with irritable bowel syndrome. But it also slows the intestines. So if the problem that you have is too much fluid in your intestines, it will slow things down and maybe give your intestines a little bit longer to reabsorb some of that fluid and prevent you from having as much diarrhea. There's a final new class of IBS medications that tends to work for both IBS-C and IBS-D. It's called Zyfaxin, X-I-F-A-X-I-N. This is actually a special antibiotic that is designed to keep the bacteria in your intestines in check. So if you do have some of those FODMAP carbohydrates, and if they do make it down your gut to the bacteria, and the bacteria try and ferment those carbohydrates and produce gas as a result, it will limit the amount of bacteria that are in your gut, which will decrease how much gas is being produced, and again, will make you less crampy. Sometimes using these medicines in combination, the bentol for the antispasm effect, one of the calming nerve medication, depending on whether you have IBS-C or IBS-D, and the zyfaxin to keep the excessive gas and fermenting bacteria in check can be very successful in calming many of the effects of whatever type of irritable bowel you may have. As I said, this oftentimes is a disease of young women. Young women tend to be the most sensitive to this kind of neurological hypersensitivity, overactivity of the nerves in your gut. And so hopefully with a combination of watching what you eat, avoiding FODMAPs, and if necessary, taking one or more of the medications we talked about. You can go from somebody who's locked in the house, worried that they're going to have constipation, diarrhea, and cramps, to a young, happy woman playing outside and enjoying life. So how can Active Doctors Online work for you? Well, Active Doctors Online has several solutions that can help you manage your IBS or whatever medical symptoms you might be having. First of all, we have our personal health records. Using, using our personal health records, you can keep all of your medical records available wherever you are, whenever you need them. So you can keep track of your bowel movements. You can keep track of what medicines you have tried for your IBS that have worked for you or have not worked for you. So if for whatever reason you move and you need to go see a new doctor, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. All of that information is always there for you. With our second medical opinions, 
let's say that you have IBS or what are the more complicated diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease or celiac disease. We can put you in touch with one of our top specialists from around the United States and around the world and get a, a electronic second opinion within 48 hours of the upload of all of your records so that we could give you our advice on what we think might be some of the best treatment alternatives for you. And finally, with our e-consultations, if your doctor participates with Active Doctors Online, we can put you in touch through video conferencing with your doctor and make it so that you can get some of your questions answered or maybe your medications tailored to you without always having to come to the doctor's office for a visit, which for a young working professional can sometimes be quite inconvenient. Now with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Tom, who can tell you a little bit more about how to get in touch with Active Doctors Online to get involved with us and to help your doctor treat you better. Well, thank you, Dr. Zahowski, for another excellent presentation. Here at Active Doctors, our vision is to reinvent healthcare by providing user-friendly mobile health solutions that allow people all over the world to live healthier, safer, and more productive lives. We strive to educate, engage, and empower our members to take control of their health destiny to save time, money, and even lives. We hope you've enjoyed today's presentation, and we invite you to start your free 30-day trial over on activedoctorsonline.com and by clicking Get Started. For more information, to schedule a demo, or if you have any questions about our service, please feel free to contact Active Doctors using the information on screen. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next month for another informative health webinar.